Hello, everyone. Good morning. Good evening, wherever you are watching us today. Uh, thank you so much for attending today's session. And uh, of course, uh, we, we don't want to go ahead without saying thank you to Kunal and his awesome team for giving us this opportunity uh, to present to you today. Uh, as you can see, the purpose of uh, today's web, and of course, uh, I wish, uh, we all wish that you are, that this session actually finds you in a good health uh, and, and you and your loved ones in these challenging times. Um, the purpose of this webinar is primarily to go over um, applying to U.S. universities in the, in the current times, uh, what should students know. So uh, these are challenging times, of course, and there are a lot of things that we need to, um, to be updated on uh, about like uh, what have changes in the educational system. So uh, currently in the US, there are more than 1 million international students that are actually studying. Um, internationals are actually studying from, uh, from all around the world. And uh, obviously we want to, um, to update you and give you some updates on the current situation that is happening now in the US, uh, whether it changes and, and so on and so forth. Uh, my colleagues and I, uh, Rashad, as you can see, um, will be with me and also Liz and, and myself um, will be presenting to you today about, um, and it is a great pleasure to uh, present to you. An overview of the session in the next uh, slide, we'll, we'll go over, um, uh, the U.S. university application process, and we will also go over uh, choosing the right university fit. Uh, we will talk about the changes to the admission process and uh, questions that uh, you should ask as a student when applying during these current uh, challenging times. Uh, we will go also about uh, on uh, over scholarships and financial resources, uh, U.S. student visa processes, overview of our universities and questions and answers at the end. So please, if you have any questions, please feel free to post them now uh, or uh, through our uh, live uh, chat. Uh, the U.S. application process. So as an international student uh, studying in the U.S., it is very uh, wanting to study in the United States. It is very, very important uh, to understand the educational system in the United States. It is also very important to uh, uh, to identify your strengths academically, professionally, before you actually start uh, applying to the U.S. Uh, so these are two more uh, two very important components that we advise international students to know about is uh, understanding who they are academically. What do we mean by that specifically is being prepared, uh, counseled correctly, and also having the resume or the CV, the qu academic qualification, the professional qualification, the language skills, and also being prepared just like if you will be uh, going to apply or leaving for a job. So school involvement in events, athletics, scholarships, uh, extracurricular activities, uh, clubs, organization, involvement in community services, and of course your GPA, SAT, TOEFL, and score. These are all components that will define who you are as a person when you apply to any university. Uh, understanding the educational system is also very important, as I said. Uh, when, when, we say, when we say understanding, I mean by that specifically knowing the type of institution that you want to join. Uh, by knowing the type of the institution you want to join, before that you need to know what is the difference between all these types of institutions that actually exist in the United States. In the United States, there are public universities, there are private, there are four-year college universities and community colleges and private career colleges. Public, public universities, they could be either funded by local and state governments, they're known for low tuition fees, the liberal arts institutions, they could be my, uh, mid, small or large uh, institutions. Private, it's pretty much the same thing except that they are also offer same tuition rates regardless of state residency, not affiliated with the government and you don't get funded, they're not being funded by local and state government. Uh, maybe a nonprofit business, private foundation or religious, uh, they could also be for profit like career online or technical. The four year college universities, uh, and that could be either private or pub public, the advanced degree like masters and PhD, just like our universities today. Uh, we do also, uh, you should also be aware of the community colleges and private career colleges as well. In the next slide, uh, so now that you know uh, the difference between these uh, type of institutions that actually exist in the US and how you could prepare yourself uh, personally and academically and professionally. So uh, it is the time now for you to choose the right university. Choosing the right university or the right fit in the current times, um, there are seven components that we put together here for you to, to look at. 
First of all, is the location of the school. Do you want to live in um, in the south, in the west, in the center, or in the east of the United States? Do you want to live in a? Uh, do you want to be in a in any study at a university that actually uh, exists outside this, uh, this uh, the city and the suburbs? Uh, what kind of weather do you do you want to experience when you come to the U.S.? Those are all questions when it comes to location of the institution. The value. The value here uh, refers to either the um, um, your budget, of course, uh, also the uh, tuition fees and also the scholarship that actually exists and how much you could offer, uh, you could afford actually when you, uh, if you want to go to that particular institution. Academics, they're here, we're talking about all the academic programs that are offered by the institution. So it's very important to know and ask what are the academics. And when we're asking about the academics, you want to ask what are the rankings of those programs whether nationwide or worldwide. Housing here is also very important. If you, as an international student coming to the United States, you wanna know if housing is guaranteed to you, if it is guaranteed to you, you wanna know if it is guaranteed to you only for the first year, second year, third year, or for the four years that as an international student. You wanna also ask the questions whether uh, the housing on campus, what does it include? Does it include gym? Does it include other activities? and how many, how many people actually live in it. Uh, and that's a very important component. Diversity is very important as an international student. I wanna know how many students actually exist at that uh, university. Uh, if I am coming from India, for example, I wanna know whether uh, that university has uh, students from India, how many international students that university have. Research is very important and we know the importance of it for when we actually uh, graduate from any university, given the hands-on experience of uh, important uh, to find a job. So we want to know what is the ranking in research? Do we have, is it guaranteed? And how do I get involved? Admission requirements here, that's the last component and it's very important uh, knowing and understanding the admission requirements for each university and how does that match your expectations? Do I have those uh, requirements? Do I meet the deadlines that are offered there? And more importantly, we always ask students to get familiar with the deadlines, the scholarships, the, the GPA, and of course, get to know your admissions counselor. Get to know me, Rashad, or Liz, talk to us. We will advocate for you. We will guide you uh, through the right steps and make things easier for you. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Rashad. All right. So um, the, uh, the title of our uh, program is uh, What You Need to Know in the Challenging Times, uh, in a sense. So what I'm going to be kind of talking about is, um, is some of those things regarding to different areas of the application process and processes. So um, as far as, um, as, far as the, the standardized test, we, we know that there have been some big changes with, with college admissions, um, university admissions uh, across the board and standardized tests is no um, is no uh, is not exempt from it. So uh, we have um, we we know that uh, some of the tests have been uh, canceled. They've been postponed. Uh, there have been challenges with students being able to have access to it. Uh, so one of the things that we want to um, we want to uh, kind of outline for you is uh, whether or not uh, the the student is going to be waiving those application requirements um, like the SAT. Uh, so. <laughs> With, um, with that, we, we understand that it's, it's been a challenge as well to take other uh, you know, standardized tests such as the GRE, the GMAT um, for, for business school. So you want to you wanna understand exactly how the university that you're looking to apply to is going to be uh, handling those types of challenges. Are they going to be uh, offering uh, conditional admission? Uh, so that's definitely one thing that you want to uh, ask your university rep as you build uh, a great relationship with um, with him or her. Um, the same things that have been kind of talking uh, have been taking place as far as the proficiency tests. Uh, many of you know that you have to prove your English proficiency. Um, very common for the TOEFL or the IELTS to be a part of your plans there. Um, since those uh, have not been uh, have not been uh, available in person, many of those have been uh, taking place. Uh, on, on online formats. Uh, so you want to make sure what the university that you're looking to apply to, to, um, to, to make sure that they are going to be accepting those. Many of them have and has not necessarily been a problem because it's been very standard, but 
um, make sure anyway, okay? So uh, the other option is uh, Duolingo. Duolingo is a um, testing platform for English proficiency that has been um, kind of in the marketplace for the last two to three years. Uh, some universities will accept Duolingo, uh, some will not. Um, Duolingo is a new type of test, so that's been part of the uh, issue in making sure that uh, people are, um, our universities are taking those tests or accepting them. Uh, so you want to make sure that you have a clear understanding of whether or not your university that you're looking to apply to is going to be taking the Duolingo test. All right. So uh, with that, uh, we also have uh, other different challenges that have taken place um, as far as the admissions process, um, uh, access to your academic uh, um, transcripts. That's been a huge thing. Uh, some of the schools have been uh, canceled, of course, uh, um, there have been closures. Um, so that ha has had a uh, dramatic effect on the availability of being able to get your, uh, your transcripts and the academic uh, results or other um, types of academic documents. Uh, so you want, to, uh, you want to see how is it that the school is going to be accepting these documents. So that since they cannot get some of the um, the regular documents that uh, students would be submitting. Uh, how do they uh, accept these documents? Can, is it okay for you to scan these documents? Is it okay for you to email these documents to your admissions representative? Or do you have to have your principal, your college counselor, or a guidance counselor um, um, submit these? Uh, so you want to be crystal clear in how to uh, be able to submit these things so that there's no hiccups, there's no delays or anything like that. Uh, because this, this process is going to be different from school to school. All right, um, your final exams and your national exams, um, we understand that there's been the similar types of um, challenges um, and being able to uh, sit for your final exams or take some of these exams. Um, so because they've been canceled, they've been postponed, there's been uh, other issues, um, you want to understand whether or not the university is going to be accepting alternative uh, documents uh, or proof that you've graduated, transcripts, things like that. Uh, so uh, this is another great talking point uh, to be asking your university admissions counselor uh, because this is going to be different from school to school as well. Um, is there um, a, a, a not more application deadlines, extensions, uh, any other fee waivers? Uh, all great questions to ask. We all know that uh, deadlines have been a big thing. Most of the um, schools are operate off of May 1st deadline. Uh, we've definitely seen that a lot of the uh, universities have extended these deadlines, some of them to uh, June 1st, some of them to June 15th, even July uh, and, and, and further than that. So you wanna understand if you're still looking to uh, attend um, university this fall, uh, what those deadlines are. There may still be some colleges that uh, are open for you to uh, apply to. All right, so uh, as far as fee waivers are concerned, that is into the mix as well. Uh, some of these schools um, have been uh, offering uh, more of a broad access to fee waivers. So uh, another great conversation to have with the university uh, rep as well. Um, and then once you have uh, selected the school that you uh, want to go to, um, most of us know the enrollment confirmation will save your seat at that, at, at that specific school that you're attending on uh, applying to or attending. Um, many times that enrollment confirmation is $50, $100 can be $300 or even more dollars than that. Uh, so you want to see like how are, if you pay that enrollment deposit uh, and say you were not have you, you did not have the opportunity to um, enroll or attend in person. Um, will that enrollment confirmation be refunded? Uh, what other kinds of things happen? Can you defer and then that enrollment deposit follow you to the new semester that you're deferring to? Uh, so you want to be crystal clear on that as well uh, and ask those questions. Uh, and these are all great questions to be able to, that, that we're actually getting from many, many other students. So don't be afraid to to, to start these conversations. Um, talking about deferring, um, are students allowed to defer? Um, 
do you have to reapply? Most most times you can just you can just defer your admission for up to one year, uh, but you want to understand at the university that you're looking to go to, uh, what does that process look like? Is there an online form that you can just fill out um, at your computer uh, or on your phone, uh, or is there uh, more of a uh, can you just send a just an email to your to your admissions counselor? Uh, but you want to be un you want to understand exactly what that process looks like at, um, at any of the schools that you're taking a look at going to. Uh, finally, finances. We all know that finances are a huge thing that uh, takes place as far as or that's considered within your um, your college search. Um, and we understand that because of the current situation, um, your financial situation may have changed. Uh, so it. Um, Many colleges, we understand that these challenges uh, exist. Uh, we've talked to students and we've, uh, we've had to uh, make adjustments just like you have as well. Um, but are they, is the college or university um, looking to uh, pro provide additional scholarships uh, that you can apply for? Um, uh, this has uh, been something definitely that has, uh, has, that has taken place. So you definitely want to be understanding of um, and ask any of these additional questions. So with that, we're, we'll talk to uh, Liz uh, about other financial kind of uh, implications. Thanks, Rashad. Um, so as you're thinking about financial opportunities to fund your education in the United States, of course, students always have questions about the types of scholarships that are available to apply for. So as you're thinking through different scholarship opportunities, just note that there are scholarships, of course, available through university um, institutions and colleges, but there are also additional scholarship opportunities outside of the university that you can consider. So I'm just going to briefly talk through some of the different types of scholarships available for international students. Um, so the first type of scholarship that you are probably familiar with would be a merit based scholarship. This is typically available through universities and colleges that you would be applying for, and it would be based off of your academic merits, such as your high school grade point average um, or the SAT or possibly ACT if you needed to submit that for admissions. So typically they're looking at top students who are um, high academic achievers, and this can be something that you have to either apply for separately from your application process, or you may be automatically considered for a merit scholarship um, just by applying through the university. So each university campus will have a little bit of a different process for some of those merit scholarships. So definitely reach out to the admissions counselor from the university or college that you're applying for to find out about the specific criteria and what is needed to be considered for those merit scholarships. Um, the second type of scholarship would be a need-based scholarship. This could be for students who are high academic achievers, but maybe have high financial need as well. Um, again, each university has a different profile that, and application process for need-based scholarships. Some universities, you just need to submit a form um, with your financial information to be considered for that need-based scholarship. Other universities, you might just need to send an email to the admissions counselor letting them know your financial situation. Um, and other universities may request the College Board CSS profile, which is um, kind of a lengthy application form that you would fill out um, clarifying your financial need, and you would submit that to the universities that you're applying for as well. Again, each university has a little bit of a different process for that need-based scholarship, but those are available for um, at some universities for high academic achieving students as well. Um, the next type of, of scholarship available that you could um, be considered for is a country-based scholarship. This could be where a university or an organization has a scholarship available for students coming from a specific country. Um, so in this case, if you are applying to a university, um, they may have a scholarship set up that's only available for students from India. This could be something that was set up by an alumni from India who just wanted to see more um, opportunities for funding students from their home country um, or other private donors, or it could be set up by the university to diversify um, 
the scholarships available for students coming from various countries to encourage more students to apply. So again, some universities do offer these country-based scholarships um, and also some private organizations may offer um, specific country-based scholarships um, such as the Rotary Club, um, which is something that's worldwide and offers different scholarship funding opportunities. Um, the next type of scholarship would be government funded scholarships. Um, this would be scholarship opportunities either through the Ministry of Education or through um, the government from your home country. Um, this is something you would want to connect with your high school counselors um, to see if there might be different government types of scholarships that they're aware of. Um, another resource you can connect with, of course, is Education USA or in India, the USIEF. Um, U.S. India Education Foundation. They typically have up-to-date information about government-funded scholarships and opportunities as well um, as they develop for new students. So that is something to look into. Um, and then of course there's privately funded scholarships. This could be privately funded scholarships through the university or college that you're applying for where a donor set up a specific scholarship available for international students. Again, it could be country specific or it could be major specific where they want to see more students applying for nursing or more students applying for um, an education program. So that is something that usually should be um, available as information on the university website for some of those privately funded scholarships, but you can also reach out to the admission counselor for those as well. Um, and then kind of similar to the country based scholarships, but more broader would be the, the diversity scholarships. This is oftentimes where a university wants to diversify the types, type of students that are applying to their institution from around the world. So they'll offer um, scholarships from underrepresented countries or um, student populations to, who are applying to the university, again, to encourage diversifying their student body, making sure that they're not getting too many students from a specific region within the US or a specific country from around the world, they want to create equal opportunities for students to apply um, to their campus and to their programs. Uh, another type of scholarship, of course, is athletic scholarships. Um, this is typically available at institutions that have NCAA Division I, II, and in some cases, Division III as well. Um, so you want to, if you're thinking about going into collegiate athletics at an NCAA um, institution, you can find out more about the athletic scholarship process um, through their athletic department, but also through talking to your admission counselor. So typically um, students who receive athletic scholarships are recruited to the athletic team. And then there may be some scholarship funding available to cover a portion of your tuition or um, towards your living expenses, or in some cases it may be a full scholarship. So that's definitely something to look into as well, depending on what athletic um, ability or level you may have. And then of course, departmental scholarships. Um, by departmental scholarship, we mean your academic department or your academic faculty that you might be applying to. So if you're looking at applying to an engineering program or um, a program in psychology or social sciences or arts and humanities, there may be specific scholarships available through the university for students studying those majors. Um, and so that typically would be a separate application process apart from your application for admission um, to the university or to the program. And so you'd wanna reach out again to your admission counselor or even to the academic um, department coordinators to find out if there are any specific scholarships available to you. And one thing I wanna mention about scholarships as well, um, if you apply for scholarships when you're accepted to a university and you don't receive any scholarships for that first year, there are still opportunities to apply for additional scholarship funding once you're a current student at the university. Oftentimes universities and colleges will have scholarships that are available for first year students, but they also want to retain those students at the university to make sure that they're supported financially to finish their program. So oftentimes current students who are enrolled in their programs can apply for additional scholarship funding later on during your program. So I want to mention that just to encourage you um, throughout that scholarship process, there's many opportunities available. All right, I'll jump over to the next slide. Uh, 
And then these are just some uh, financial aid resources that you can start your scholarship research from. The first would be the or Institute of International Education. They actually have a scholarship search engine um, based on program, your education level, as well as the country that you're applying from or the country that you're planning on studying in. So this is a great search platform um, as you're thinking about some of those privately fund and government funded scholarship opportunities. Again, Education USA um, is a great resource in India. It's uh, uh, Education USA also goes by the name US India Education Foundation, USIEF. So make sure that you're um, checking in with their offices. They're located all across India, of course, um, and they have up-to-date information about scholarship opportunities as well, specifically for students applying to the United States from India. Um, the other scholarship would be the hashtag you are welcome here scholarship, which is a renewable scholarship um, that covers up to 50% of the tuition. This was set up by universities who are wanting to make sure that international students know that they're welcome on our campuses. Um, and so many um, universities across the United States are participating in that hashtag, you are welcome here scholarship campaign. Of course, NAFSA of co is a financial aid resource as well. If you just search NAFSA, they have information about scholarships as well as private student loan options for international students. And then the final three um, search websites are just ideas for you to Again, look at different search engines um, for scholarship or student loan opportunities, such as College Board, internationalstudent.com, and studyusa.com. Um, and then just quickly for the next segment, I wanted to mention the US student visa process as you're thinking about applying to US universities. Of course, the next phase after getting admission is applying for that visa. Um, we understand right now that visa um, appointments are on hold temporarily because of COVID-19 situation. So we do encourage you, if you've been accepted to a U.S. university, make sure that you are um, checking the U.S. Department of State website regularly, as well as the specific embassy or consulate website to find out if any of those visa wait times um, have been updated. There was um, I think a few visa appointment openings in October for students um, applying it from India. So it's good to check that pretty regularly, but you can also reach out to your admissions counselor as well. But basically, as you're thinking about applying for that student visa, the first step is to get admission to a US university. Um, from there, that university will send you an immigration document, either an I-20 or a DS-2019, uh, which will have your financial information and your program information that you will use to apply for the student visa. From there, you can schedule your visa interview um, and prepare the documents that you'll bring with you to that visa appointment, which would include that I-20 document, the admissions letter, financial documents, transcripts, and your test results. Basically the same documents that you use to apply to your university, you'll also bring that with you to your visa appointment. Um, so with that, we'll transition, I think, to the next segment here as well, talking about our specific campuses and what we are doing to support students during COVID-19. All right, so uh, again, I'm uh, back here. My name is Rashad from Missouri Western State University. And so uh, really quickly, I just wanted to kind of give you an, an update. Um, so we are um, known as a Missouri's only applied learning institution. And what that means is that uh, students who attend Missouri Western, 100% um, of them will uh, graduate with an applied learning um, uh, experience, whether that is a, uh, an internship, uh, a co-op program, service learning, uh, other things. So uh, we have with it, within that, we have about 100 majors and minors on uh, some graduate programs for students to be able to have these experience in, experiences in, uh, as well as we have about uh, 5,000 undergraduate students. Uh, some of our top majors you can see uh, are business, engineering, technology, biology, um, computer science, nursing, sports management too. Uh, and then we're also very uh, affordable for, a, uh, for international students for an American college. Um, we have an automatic scholarship that is uh, gives up to $6,000 per year. Uh, so the cool thing about this scholarship is that 
once students come back for their second year of college, they will get uh, $1,000 added to their scholarship, uh, another 500 for their junior and their senior year. So uh, the, the scholarship actually grows every year that you return to school. Uh, there is a full ride scholarship uh, available as well. It is on a need-based uh, basis. So students do have to prove that they have um, financial need uh, for the scholarship, uh, as well as um, there's only one of these scholarships as well. It goes to one international student. Um, no SAT is required for admissions or for scholarship. Um, so uh, that's definitely one thing of note. And then lastly, you can see that our uh, total scholar or our total tuition at our university is uh, only $26,180 and that includes everything your tuition your housing meals um, as well as your health insurance and books so with that I will turn it over to uh, UC hello everyone so uh, I'm gonna have you fly with me now from the center of America all the way to the East Coast specifically New York so welcome to New York uh, hi everyone, my name is Youssef, International Admissions Counselor at Stony Brook University. Stony Brook University is our name, we also go by SBU or just SUNY Stony Brook as a part of the SUNY system. Uh, as you can see on the screen, um, that's our campus. We are located on Long Island, beautiful campus surrounded by a lot of beaches and very known for a large campus with a lot of things that is going on there. So uh, we are among the top 1% in the world in terms of ranking. We're also around among the top 40 public universities according to US News. To be exact, it's top 35 public universities. Recent also a uh, uh, recent also uh, rankings uh, classify Stony Brook University to be the top public one, the top one public university in New York State. We are um, we are a home of more than 26,000 students, and we are also a home of more than 4,000. 400 international students from all around the world, representing more than uh, 110 countries. A large campus, a lot of going on over there uh, in terms of academics, in terms of involvement, whether through uh, clubs, through organizations and events and so on and so forth. In terms of academics, we have more than 200 academic programs. We're very famous for engineering, medical, uh, journalism. Uh, we do also have business. We were very famous for a lot of research opportunities available on campus. Speaking of that, Stony Brook University has been involved for more than uh, 2,000 uh, faculty-led inventions. Just to mention one example is the MRI technology, which won the Nobel Prize of Medicine back in 2003, and of course invented by one of our uh, faculty members. So. Uh, so with that, uh, that's Stony Brook University. We will share um, my details um, later and I will hand it over to my colleague, Liz. Great, so again, my name is Liz. I'm from Minnesota State University, Mankato. So we're located in the north central part of the United States, um, bordering Canada uh, in the Midwest region of the US. And our campus is a public university. Um, we're more than 150 years old and have grown to a mid-sized university of about 14,000 students. Um, and we proudly welcome more than 1,200 international students from over 90 countries, including India, of course. We have a very active India, Indian Student Association on our campus that plans and coordinates events um, and makes sure that new incoming students are very well taken care of as they transition to our campus. Um, as far as our rankings, we are ranked as number 18 in the public un universities in the US Midwest, according to US News and World Report. We're also one of the top 20 universities for undergraduate research, which means if you have a research interest um, at the undergraduate level, you don't have to wait your, your grad program to participate in research. You can start that um, in your undergraduate level, uh, either working with a faculty mentor on an individual research project or joining a research cohort team. Um, as far as our academic programs, we have more than 130 bachelor degrees as well as 80 graduate programs and doctoral programs. Um, and as a public institution, we are relatively affordable because of our low cost of tuition as well as low cost of living being in the central part of the United States tends to be a little bit more affordable. Um, so our average cost of attendance is around 25,000 US dollars per academic year. That includes the tuition and the living expenses. 
We also offer scholarships for undergraduate students. Um, for first year students, the International Maverick Scholarship is a guaranteed scholarship. All you need to do is be accepted to the university and you receive that scholarship. Um, and it is renewable each year throughout your program. And then for graduate students, we also have a um, graduate funding available through graduate assistantships or research assistantships as well. Um, so that's a little overview of the campus, but I also want to mention too, um, during the time of COVID-19, as students are applying and may not have access to regular testing or academic transcripts, we are working with you on a case-by-case -case basis. So if you have difficulty getting access to your high school transcripts um, or test results, such as English proficiency, reach out to us and we will help you with that process um, as you apply. We also have extended our application deadline um, and are offering uh, application fee waivers as well. So a few things to consider um, as you're applying to universities as well. So with that, I think we're gonna transition to um, a brief question and answer time. Yes, so we're gonna, uh, we already answered like four questions of the overall uh, number of around more, a little bit more than 10 questions. So what we're gonna do actually will be answering one question for each. Uh, basically we are three here universities and only one of us will be answering it unless there is something that is different to uh, in terms of answers. So going to the first question that we have not answered so far is, we have seven now, do universities mean research do universities mean research and colleges mean no research in general contexts? Did anyone understand this question? Can you say that again? Sorry. Do universities mean research and colleges mean no research oh, in general I see. contexts? Yes. Yeah, so what's the difference between a, a university and a college? Is it based on research? Um, I think that's that's how I'm understanding that question. Yeah, yes. I'm, I'm yeah, I'm, I'm think I think that's what it is. I think um, it's going to change from uh, from college to college, to university to university. Uh, just so you guys know, um, a university and a college is like a, a, a synonymous term in the U.S. So you can go to a college and do research. You can go to a university and do research. Um, the number of uh, research opportunities is going to change from university to university, college to college. Um, so, yeah, so it's, uh, it's a little bit of a different term uh, in the U.S. than it is uh, in some other places. Great. The second question is, can you share also about campus safety and also safety precaution measures taken in times of COVID-19? I think most of uh, Rashad and Liz answered this question. I have not talked about our response as a university. So SUNY Stony Brook University, uh, located in New York, outside the city, of course, and New York being hit so bad uh, with the virus. Actually, we are very proud of our response and how we actually uh, all uh, get together and help the community. We, be, we were like, we're very proud of all the things that we have done. So a lot of you, uh, students actually stayed on campus and they are supported and still being supported by the community and it is safe it is actually way better right now uh, a lot of uh, campus restaurants are open we are fully open right now but of course we are taking social distancing measures and so on and so forth definitely in terms of safety is is safe and we are proud of what we've done so far and uh, the next question says, how would merit-based scholarship work as many universities are going test optional? What would be the scholarship criteria for 12 class students be based on? Um, very good question. And we are actually prepared to share that answer with you. Liz? For merit-based scholarships actually on our campus, um, we are test optional normally, even apart from COVID-19. And so our scholarships are based off of your high school transcripts. We don't require the SAT for those scholarships. That's unique um, for Minnesota State University, Mankato, and also some other universities have the same criteria. Um, if they are test optional for the SAT, they're likely basing your uh, merit-based scholarships off of your high school transcripts, um, as well as probably some essay or letter of recommendation. However, for institutions that normally require the SAT and have now gone test optional, I think some of those universities are making accommodations to consider students for those merit-based scholarships. 
They may not yet have that criteria mapped out because it has been a recent decision for a lot of campuses to go test optional at, during this time. So it's good to reach out to your admission counselor to find out what criteria has changed for some of those merit-based scholarships now that you won't be submitting an SAT. Um, are there additional documents that you need to submit as far as letters of recommendation, an essay, um, extracurricular activities, as well as your high school transcripts? Yeah, that pretty much applies to SUNY Stony Brook as well. We've gone test optional and pretty much we will list all the requirements specifically. Next question, I would like to learn information on teaching and research assistantships, uh, if it is available for undergraduate majors and also about research opportunities. Rashad? Uh, so at uh, Missouri Western Uni State University, uh, we do uh, offer, um, we already talked about the scholarships as well as uh, research opportunities. Uh, these types of things are going to be very common for, uh, for universities to be able to um, uh, offer at uh, varying uh, opportunities. So uh, as far as if the, the school that you're taking a look at going to, you're going to want to uh, speak to someone just like me at, the, at each school to understand exactly how these, um, these opportunities will be offered and how you can, uh, you can apply for them. Absolutely, and the same thing applies to Stony Brook University. Uh, what academic support will I receive as an undergraduate student? Um, as an undergraduate student at most universities and colleges, you will be assigned to an academic advisor from your program. That advisor will be your point of reference throughout your entire undergraduate program to help you understand the types of classes you need to take to complete your major on time and stay on track and finish within four years or maybe faster in some cases. Um, and they'll also help you understand the academic requirements, um, opportunities for tutoring if you're struggling in some of your classes. Most universities do offer free tutoring um, for undergraduate students for common programs. And also most universities and colleges require professors um, or faculty from the classes to hold at least 10 hours, uh, 10 office hours each week for students. Um, and so if you're having specific questions in one of your classes, you will be able to access your um, professors during those office hours and go and get more clarification. So universities have a lot of academic support available for students because we do want you to be successful. Thank you, Liz. Um, and that applies to Stony Brook University and I think the same thing for Missouri Western. Um, I have two questions that I'm gonna combine together because they're pretty much the same. Uh, and each of us will be very shortly touched on this. Uh, what are the application requirements for your university in terms of academics? Um, touch on tuition, meals, and housing costs as well. At Stony Brook University, uh, the admission, our minimum GPA requirement is 3.0. Uh, we do not require the SAT, just one of the IELTS or the TOEFL or the uh, or 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 Duolingo would be enough. Of course, uh, we need your grade 10, 11, and 12. If you don't have to submit us uh, grade nine. Uh, we will also, in terms of tuition, we, we need, um, uh, the tuition fees is pretty much $25,000 per year uh, with $14,000 for housing and that include meals and housing, of course. Um, and then for Minnesota State University, Maine Cato, of course, um, our cost of attendance on average includes a scholarship available for first year undergraduate students. So our tuition is actually um, just under 10,000 US dollars per academic year. Um, and then living expenses, because we're in the Midwest region as well, it ranges um, depending on if you're living on campus or off campus, it can range anywhere from about um, 8,000 to $10,000 per academic year as well. Um, but we do have on-campus dormitory accommodations available for students. Um, it's guaranteed for first year students. So if that's interest of interest to you, you can apply to live in the dorms, but you're not required to. You can also live off campus as well. So uh, for Missouri Western, um, very similar to what Liz was saying uh, as far as being able to live on campus and such, but our full cost of attendance, uh, again, um, with, uh, with tuition, room and board, uh, health insurance and books is $25,180. Uh, that is going to um, be a per year cost, and uh, we already have, um, talked about like the scholarships that are available. 
Um, and we do have a full ride scholarship available as well. Uh, minimum cost of attendance or minimum um, um, requirement for Missouri Western is a 2.5. Um, that can change if you want to go into obviously a more challenging um, a major. So, uh, so that is uh, something uh, that is is definitely going to uh, take be taken under consideration. Um, as far as I see, one other question I'll just go and kind of talk about really quickly. Uh, as far as the how things are weighted uh, for us, and I think for m many of us, it's going to be uh, taken under consideration just your uh, GPA. Um, uh, definitely that's a, the case for us. Um, and I know that uh, some of the other things will, will kind of take going into um, importance as well, like your extracurriculars, community service, but definitely the, uh, the GPA is going to be um, something that is that all of us are going to take a look at um, more closely. Yes, thank you, Rashad. If you could just like put the slide uh, that, that shows our contact details. Uh, I don't know if you have it there. Thank you. Uh, one, the last question that we have for now is a uh, uh, very good question, actually. Would admissions be impacted for next year's session of 2021? Um, as many of our class uh, of 12 uh, are deferring and also uh, the impact of housing and class student faculty ratio. So uh, your, your, your question, we're used to it. By now, to be honest with you, uh, we're all like experiencing a large number of students that are preferring to defer instead of taking the option online option uh, for the fall format. It's very understandable. But we also want to make sure when talking to students, our senior students, that these are very unprecedented challenges, times that we are facing. But uh, think about the, the other semesters where you will be able actually to come here to the U.S. and actually spend them. So it's not only about the first semester, it's all about the rest. So whether you choose to go ahead with the online for the fall or defer, uh, there, we are aware of that and we are planning this accordingly because we are uh, guaranteeing, guaranteeing your housing uh, uh, and there will be absolutely no effect in terms of class student faculty ratio, at least for Stony Brook University. And it would be the same for Minnesota State as well. Um, so in general, even apart from the current challenging times, we don't cap admission. So if as long as students meet the minimum admission criteria, they're guaranteed acceptance. So if you're applying to our campus, um, we will have many students who are deferring to next fall 2021, but that will not impact our application um, or admission rates for the 12th year seniors who are also applying for the first time for fall 2021. So we'll, we will uh, make sure that we have the seats available for your students um, for their programs as well. Great. So with that, we have gone all over, over all the questions. Cornell? Um, yeah, I think there are a few more, right? Did you see? Uh, I think about your current Indian students and uh, I don't know if I missed it. Oh, something just been added. Yeah, I missed that. Okay, uh, I have... Uh, I have met many uh, SUNY institutions at my high school as I am interested in computer science as a major and minor in arts. Can you share how Stony Brook University would be a different as I am a bit confused? Uh, that's actually a good question. Computer science is one of actually a uh, top majors uh, that we have. It's actually, uh, we call it the restricted major uh, where uh, getting a direct admission is very competitive, but it is possible. Uh, so basically, uh, given the situation right now, uh, we this year what we did in order to get a, uh, uh, admission to a computer science uh, major, uh, we do require a minimum GPA of 90. Uh, we do require uh, that the student have taken some classes towards the math and physics, um, and also computer science uh, during high school, we do require uh, that the student uh, have a minimum um, SAT score in the mat of 700. Um, so if we, when we go test optional specifically, um, we would not be requiring the SAT probably. We're, we're still like finalizing that with the engineering department so they can tell us whether uh, we would still, even that we go test optional or we will raise the GPA, we will raise the requirement to a higher bar. So, uh, yeah, so basically, uh, that's, I hope that answers your question. Uh, so how different we are in terms of for next year for 2021 applications, we don't know yet, but we will uh, definitely keep you posted. 
Uh, can you discuss about campus life and culture as well as activities uh, as out of classes experience would be important? Of course, it is very important in, in all the US universities. Uh, academics is not only what it's not all about academics. It's all about getting involved on campus. We do have a wide range of events, wide range of activities. You can get involved in so many things. Uh, Stony Brook has over 400. Uh, Missouri Western, um, Minnesota State, they also have pretty much the same time, uh, the same kind of uh, number or more of, of activities and clubs offered. You can even like come up with your own activity and all own events as an international student. It's easily, we made it very easily. And the input of uh, cul cultural input and the input of international students is very important to us, uh, of course. Are international students required to live on campus at your three universities and also, uh, yes. So for our Stony Brook University, for example, we, uh, we do guarantee housing for international students for four years, uh, and it will be up to you to choose. It's not mandatory to, to live on campus, but you can choose to live off campus if you want. And same for Minnesota State Mankato. Um, it's optional to live on campus for the first year. Um, and we also do have meal plans available for um, students with all dietary needs, including vegetarian, halal, um, and dietary restrictions if you're gluten-free or, or anything like that. So that is available for you. Uh, yeah, that, that would be the same for uh, Missouri Western. Um, uh, students are, manda are mandated to live on campus for the first year. Okay, I'm a parent participating on behalf of my child regarding form I-20 requirements. What are the amounts of your individual universities and is it a requirement to be submitted at the time of admission or after admission? So I-20 is, so I'm gonna let Liz touch on that very quickly. Yes, um, so as far as the I-20 requirements, when you, before you can receive the I-20, you do need to submit the financial documentation in order for that university to issue the I-20. So unfortunately, you can't wait to submit that information, um, or, or excuse me, you can wait to submit it in some cases after admission. Um, it depends on the university requirements. Some will ask for it as part of the application process prior to admission, and some will ask for it after admission. So again, it depends on each university or college. So for Minnesota State Mankato, for example, we do require you to submit the financial documentation or scholarship award information at the time of admission. Um, other campuses though will um, admit students based off of their academic requirements and then ask for the financial documentation later on. Yeah, pretty much the same thing for, for us as well. We do require the financial statements. Uh, that's the law, yeah. Right, so um, students, if there are any questions uh, we are now you know uh, five minutes away from time and I'm, I'm sure the university's officers have other engagements as well so we must be respectful of their time parents students uh, kindly post anything uh, just to uh, gently share this will be said shared, shared with your school guidance counselors so um, they can share it with other faculty and um, of course other students and other members in the school uh, any last questions uh, to the guidance officers? Um, uh, uh, Mr. UC Bahib has also shared the three email addresses of the three uh, esteemed uh, panelists who are, who are participating today. So uh, kindly note it down. And uh, of course, they will be free to uh, continue these conversations where, uh, well after this uh, session is over. I'm sure and they would love to be in touch with you. Uh, for the uh, to help you out as well as to uh, in terms of the application to the individual universities. So any last questions uh, that we can see before we uh, wrap for the day? I think uh, we must uh, wrap for the day. But uh, any other final points you see the uh, uh, you see or Rashad or uh, Elizabeth that you would like to kindly share? Thank you. Thank you. So. Uh... For my last message that I would like to actually highlight here, basically towards a question uh, about current Indian students on our campuses. So uh, at Stony Brook University, for example, we have actually, we actually have more than 1,000 uh, Indian students actually studying here. Um, pretty much like, pretty much the same, the same number we have at the, at the graduate level compared to undergraduate level. Uh, we, have, uh, we have an organization, we have uh, food that is accommodating the culture of India, and, 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 and we do have a lot of things that are happening on campus. Our, uh, believe it or not, our Indian students are 
uh, we know how smart they are. We're very proud of them. There are a lot of them actually either studying engineering, uh, computer science, or the medical field, and uh, and uh, it's very very the reputation is is high on this and the research. Uh, they're highly involved in research. So basically, uh, we welcome your questions anytime. My email is there. Thank you so much, Konal, for giving us this opportunity, and we will we hope uh, we do have actually another session with. Uh, uh, another session with uh, KPT, uh, July 29. So please be there for us and we'll, we'll be talking more about engineering programs and research. Absolutely. Um, thank you so much, UC. I would like to kindly uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Elizabeth, and thank you, Mr. Rashad. We truly appreciate your kind time and joining us uh, for the Admissions 101 workshop session. Students, thank you. Uh, for participating in the quick poll, uh, as the university officers have said, they have to go for other engagements. So, but please uh, 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 keep down the email address. I'm actually going to be online for the next five minutes, so they can just take down the email address and pen it down. But uh, uh, UC, thank you so much. I know we've been in touch for kindly coordinating this. Elizabeth, I know we've been in touch as well. So thank you so much. And Rashad, as always, a pleasure. So, and I wish you all a wonderful day. Uh, please take care, stay safe, and we look forward to keeping in touch, and I'm sure the students do as well. Thank Thanks, you very Kunal. much, Kunal. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.